I've spent a lot of my artistic research life like running after technologists and being like, oh, can I come to, can I listen to your, can I talk to your, what are you reading? What, you know, what? and then now it's kind of, they come and turn around and they're like, oh, what are you reading? It's this very interesting moment where um, I feel like it's, it's a two way street. Welcome to Art and Technology. I'm Zach Kaplan, and today I'm joined by software art pioneer Casey Rias and artist Simon Denny to talk about blockchain technology's past, present, and future. In part one, we'll talk about their own journeys with blockchain technology and how it influenced their practices. Casey, why don't we start by chatting a little bit about processing, um, which feels relevant to this bigger conversation. Um, processing is a programming environment and coding language for artists. And the idea was to make a way to bring more visual people into this world of coding. So we made something to make images. But then of course people wanted to start making sound with it, making 3D prints with it. And so really early on we made it possible for people to extend it in a way where they could be independent and autonomous. And so it's grown and moved in so many unexpected ways through the energy of, of people sharing with each other. The thing that's been kind of enjoyable to watch generally about these past few months um, has been like artists collecting, artists collecting each other. Yeah, yeah, I think of collecting more than acquiring something. It's really about supporting somebody's work and somebody's vision. And I think that um, some of the blockchain environments are allowing that to happen in ways that's radically different from how the art world works. Well, Simon, we've seen your work engage with the blockchain over many years, much longer than this most recent interest. So I'm just curious, like, how would you characterize your journey with blockchain in the field? Following on from what Casey has been mentioning, I feel like I come from like a very different starting point in that I'm not involved in building infrastructure. I got interested in art and technology um, from the point of view of looking at um, the promises and visions technology business people were promoting based on blockchain narratives. So I made installations, I made board games, I interacted with people building these companies. But then I also met artists who were software engineers who, um, who were also building artworks with blockchain. This is something that I've heard a lot, this idea that art is like the killer app for blockchain. But I'm curious, like, if I said that to you, would I become a subject of your work, Simon? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess this is connects to NFTs and the kind of market explosion of NFTs. And I found it very, very interesting because it's a new twist in this narrative of where that goes, right? I grew into being an artist through the web. And the way that the web works fundamentally is that if I share an image on my website, that image can be downloaded to everybody's computer who looks at that site. Those images are just free to be shared, free to move around without any constraints. And there's been really no way to collect those works. And so this idea of an NFT is that that image um, is still completely free to travel and to, and to be copied as many times as people want. But now there can be like a contract that guarantees that one person has the property rights for that specific image. And that's, that's the thing that's radically changed. Thanks for joining part one. Today we heard a little bit about how Casey and Simon found their way into the blockchain space. In part two, we'll look a little bit into the future. We'll think about where these technologies are going and how the blockchain may support the next generation of artists and their work. Hyundai Motor, connecting art and technology.